Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Tim Potts, director of the uh, J. Paul Getty Museum. I'm delighted to see so many of you here for today's uh, lecture. Um, and before introducing the lecture, I just want to say a few words about this because it is the inaugural uh, 2016, being the inaugural year of a new series that we will be doing annually, the Getty Museum Distinguished Lecture, as we're calling it. Um, and the idea behind this series is to invite someone, a leading scholar in some area of art history um, or archaeology, the areas that we collect here at the Getty, who through these lectures will develop uh, their ideas, a new perspective, a new view, a new theory, um, something uh, novel and interesting about a major topic in art history. And the reason for three lectures is uh, just that it, it, it gives scope to develop um, a more substantive position than you just can do in a, the single hour that a lecture normally provides. So it also gives them a chance to build a position over um, each lecture will build, can build on the one before it. Um, and it just provides something that is more substantive and through both the lecture and the publication, and we will be publishing a version of these lectures each time, um, it provides a more meaningful contribution to the topic that it addresses. Just to remind you, the other lectures of this series will be uh, next week on Tuesday on Gauguin and Thursday on Cezanne. Um, and on each occasion, one of us will be introducing um, uh, Rick and, and moderating the discussion afterwards or some question and answers. Um, and on Thursday, we're delighted that we're bringing uh, Edward Goldman from um, uh, an NPR. Edward's with us today, and he's kindly agreed to um, be the... Uh, the um, interlocker on Thursday on the lecture on Cezanne. Um, today's lecture could not be a more perfect start because it takes three of the works in the Getty's own collections um, and builds the thoughts around that artist and that painting, which, as I say, is the perfect way, uh, the ideal series will be one that, as this does, relates the topic to uh, the experience you can have in the museum here at the Getty. Um, Rick Brattel is um, the complete art historian, if I can put it like that. He's been a museum curator, he's been a museum director, and for most of his career, a distinguished professor, scholar, writer, and guest curator of exhibitions. He took all of his degrees, BA, MA, and PhD at Yale. In 1980, he became curator of paintings at the Art Institute of Chicago, which is, of course, um, together with the Metropolitan, these are the two great greatest collections of Impressionist and Post-Impressionist art in this country. In 1988, he became director of the Dallas Museum of Art, and after returning, after that, returned to teaching and research at UT, University of Texas in Dallas, where his career has been based ever since, but continuing in this time to work very closely and actively with museums around the world. Today, he's the Margaret McDermott Distinguished Chair in Art and Aesthetic Studies, and the Edith O'Donnell Distinguished Chair. So he's doubly distinguished at the University of Texas in Dallas. Um, beyond teaching, which of course he does um, all the time and has had a, an impact on generations now of younger art historians, he was responsible in Dallas for introducing the first um, overview course of art history. He there, in that, at UT Dallas, also established the Center for the Interdisciplinary Study of Museums. And more, most recently, and perhaps most importantly of all, was critical in establishing the O'Donnell Institute of Art History, both based at UT Dallas and within, with a research center also within the Dallas Museum of Art, which opened as recently as December last year. And he is the director also, of course, of the O'Donnell, the founding director of the O'Donnell Institute of Art History. And I think perhaps even more extraordinary than all of these achievements is that he, as well as being the art historian at the center of this web, was the person who went out and inspired people to give the money to make it happen, and has had received a number of major gifts, uh, particularly for the O'Donnell Institute. Today, Rick is recognized as the leading scholar of Impressionism and post-Impressionism of his generation. He's curated New, mu exhibitions too numerous to mention, and so I will, only, I will be highly selective, but this is what we do on such occasions, just to remind you. Um, as far back as 88, exhibitions on the art of Paul Gauguin, uh, Pizarro and Pontoise, the painting, the painting in a Landscape in 1990, 
Um, Impressionism painting quickly in France in 2000. Gauguin and Impressionism uh, at the Kimball in 2005, and I'm, I was director of the Kimball at the time, so this was a great, a great a joy for me to collaborate with him on that exhibition. Uh, Monet and Normandy in 2006, uh, an exhibition on private collecting in Texas from the homes of Texas, at the, again at the, uh, at the Kimball Art Museum in Texas in 2009. In 2010, Pizarro's People, the Human Figure and Impressionism. 2011, an exhibition on Edouard Vuillard. In 2013, on Pizarro with um, his colleague, uh, Joachim Pizarro. And in 2014, Monet and the Seine. And there are many more. That is only a selection. Uh, and as well, of course, he's through the publication of those exhibitions, which have been major contributions to scholarship, many other works on Impressionist and post-Impressionist works, um, including the Gauguin catalogue Raisonné, which is still, he's published some volumes of, but are still uh, coming out, and indeed has written much also on architecture. So, as I say, there could be um, no more ideal person to be the uh, inaugural lecturer here at the um, Getty Museum for our Distinguished Lecturer series. Um, and as we would have hoped, and um, Brick would do, he's chosen as his topic um, something that for a long time has been somewhat neglected by academic art historians, but remains central to what the artists of this period were trying to achieve in their work, and that is nothing less than the concept of beauty. So we're delighted to, I'm delighted to um, introduce him as friend, colleague, and um, collaborator on many projects to talk to us in today's lecture on Met Manet is Beauty Transitory. Richard Battelle. Uh, let's see, where is it? Uh, thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here, and I can't believe all of you are here rather than already in front of your TV watching the red carpet treatment. Um, but this lecture actually has not uh, a little to do um, with concepts of beauty and con concepts of stardom, um, which are very familiar to us in Los Angeles. And it sort of occurred to me as I was thinking in, in the green room backstage that in many ways Los Angeles in the late 20th and early 21st century, or in the almost entirely 20th and 21st century, is really the Paris of our age because it produces most of the works of visual art which most people in the world see as Paris was the place that produced paintings that most people in the world saw um, in its great era uh, of the 19th century. I'm I am gonna talk about beauty, but I have to confess that I have no idea how to do it. Um, and one of the reasons why is that as art historians, we're never taught to talk about beauty or to even raise the word in our presentations. In fact, I have three degrees in art history and I've never even taken a course in aesthetics or aesthetic philosophy, which might strike some sensible person as rather odd, but it's true. And I remember when I was teaching my first um, introduction to the visual arts to all of these students who teach, or, 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 or my students at UTD, most of whom are scientists, and I asked, I had uh, 400 students in my class this last term, and I asked them if anybody had ever heard of Picasso, and no one raised their hand. So you can see that there's a challenge in doing this because they're all thinking about coding and chemistry and biophysics and all these things that are in STEM and there's no A in their STEM, there's no STEAM in their STEM. Um, and so we, uh, you know, it was, it was a fascinating thing to do and at the end of a class, a, a young a man came up to me and he said, it's really interesting, Dr. Patel, that you've talked um, for an entire term about works of art and never called any of them beautiful or used the word beauty when you talked about them. And it really hit me over the head and so I wrote one of my dearest friends who's an important art historian named Eva Lambois, who is at the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton. And I got a little email from him the other day. He said, the taboo about beauty. I remember Benjamin Buclo apologizing for saying that something was beautiful when we walked through an exhibition together. Strange constraint, isn't it, for people like us trafficking in aesthetic pleasure? 
And indeed, we do traffic in aesthetic pleasure, and indeed, we do ignore the concept of beauty. I'm, gonna, I'm talking to you, I want to show you a couple of slides of where I come from, because when you come to this glorious palace on the hill by Richard Meyer and all these landscaping and fabulous things, you have to realize that the rest of us come from the provinces. And th this, is my, um, this is my little Institute of Art History offices at UTD, imaginative in and interesting as it is. Um, but it's very different from the grandeur of here, and here is the, the newly opened offices in the middle um, of the Dallas Museum of Art so that our students really work, can work directly um, with works of art rather than thinking about them in an abstract way. Both of these spaces are designed by important Dallas architects because I actually believe in regional creativity, and each of them are now filled full of scholars and graduate students from um, around the country and our own students who are working with objects. So it's with the idea of a, of a place where there is an intense questioning of the nature and future of art history that I come to you today. These are the little offices before anybody obviously moved into them. Now, three months later, they're a complete mess, much to the architect's horror. Um, and I'm talking today about a painting by Manet, which I just went up to see actually for the first time since it's been at the Getty, since I haven't been here since it came. And standing and looking at it in the gallery made me really realize how incredibly important it is. And here you see a detail um, of the face of this woman. And you can do something which we can do in our digital age with blow-up photography and ext extremely high resolution of looking at all of these little tiny dots of, let's see if I can figure out how to do this, this wonderful little piece of red here and here, the tiny little brush stroke of brown that's the color of her eyes, um, the mascara which any Maybelline would love, um, this wonderful sort of controlled chaos of brush strokes that looks for all the world like it might be de Kooning, but forms into a mass of foliage and flowers that we'll look, to, look at together one interrogates this surface not by looking into the soul of the beautiful young woman who is here, but looking at her. We never gain entrance to her, and that is, of course, what Manet wanted. It's part of two recent acquisitions and brilliant acquisitions of works by Manet at the Getty, um, the beautiful pastel of, of Monsieur Rochenoir um, on the left, which is one of my favorite um, uh, Manet pastels and which is now thankfully here. And then we all know the record price paid um, for Jeanne, the painting on the right, which is one of the most important new acquisitions of Manet made by any museum in the world in the last several years. Um, you see it here in the frame that it came to the museum in, and thankfully, I didn't know this until I just went to the galleries, but thankfully the Getty has had the good taste to change the frame. And so when you go up to the galleries, you'll see a much more beautiful and much more important frame on the picture. You'll also see how um, photography can really distort paintings in their chromatic structure, because of course this image comes from the web. Here is Tim looking at the painting in the galleries. And it's, it's a sort of an, I, the reason I chose it is not just because it represents Tim, but on the web, this is the only photograph of a male viewer of this painting. And of course, I come from a generation of art historians, others of whom are sitting in this room, um, who were trained a good deal by feminist art historians, highly critical of this thing that we uh, came to call the male gaze. And if there is any um, exemplar, visual exemplar of the male gaze, <laughs> It is in front of you, and fortunately, this particular male is looking very carefully with this kind of uh, focused look at the surface rather than you know, have his, having his tongue hanging out looking at this beautiful young girl. One wonders, therefore, what a female viewer thinks of this painting made by a man and in feminist art history for men, and yet present today as a beautiful object in a society which no longer privileges the male gaze as it did so powerfully in Manet's own generation. Here it is in all of its glory, incredibly visually complex. Um, a work of art, there's not one part of it that doesn't have stroke after stroke after stroke after stroke. And those of you who know your oil painting know how difficult it is to have a kind of effect of many colors in a small area without them turning muddy. 
and it means that one attacks the painting over and over and over again, putting touches um, onto it so that each one retains its freshness and the, and the wet on wet doesn't destroy the image. I'm gonna talk about three paintings in my interrogation of beauty, and the second one is this one, which is a work of art that one would hardly ever use the word beauty about um, because it represents such a gruesome subject. Ari Matamoe by Gauguin from 1892, painted a little bit more than 10 years after the Manet, which is, uh, attempts, to, uh, attempts to interrogate beauty in a completely different way, asking completely different questions or this insanely beautiful painting by Cezanne, painted in the mid-1890s that came to the Getty from the Bakwin collection, one of the great um, late Cezanne figure pictures, and which has still a different kind of beauty. So each of the lectures will focus on a different kind of beauty. Here is a bad slide of the last great self-portrait by Manet, who was not a terribly uh, self-introspective or self-aware artist. He painted himself rarely. He writes about himself very little. We know very little about his internal life, his emotional life. It would be very difficult for a Freudian art historian um, to psychoanalyze him, though many have tried. And we see him here um, in the end of the 1870s looking kind of befuddled as he looks at himself in the mirror with his painting equipment in his hands, um, sort of trying to figure out what it is about himself as a painter that he's evoking. And of course, in the lower right-hand corner, you can see how out of focus and how incredibly quickly painted and brushed um, the evocation of his own hand and brush are, um, as if they are evoking him in real time. Um, Manet in the late 1870s was a sort of sad man because by 1879 it had become clear um, that the syphilis, which he caught many years earlier, um, was beginning really to ravage his health. And the last three years of his life in 1880, 80, 1881, 1882, and then with his death in 1883, um, were really miserable years in many ways. He writes letters saying that he can't come to visit you because he can no longer climb stairs. Um, he takes lots of naps. He goes away in the summer so that he doesn't have to see people. He, he very much constrains um, his own physical activities during this period of time. And he's really young, man. He was born in 1832. Um, and so he's only 50 years old in 1882 and um, only 51 years old or just barely 52 um, when he died in 1883. He was an artist who painted enormously in a rather short life and was a consummate painter. Let's look at what he showed at the salons, at the big public exhibition that, that were really the Academy Awards of painting um, in the 19th century. In 1880, he showed these two pictures, Chez Le Père um, in Liège on the left, and a portrait of his um, good friend Antonin Proust, who will come into this lecture a little bit earlier because he was the first owner of the Getty painting. Uh, uh, two paintings, Benet generally showed a large-scale genre painting and a smaller-scale um, portrait in each of the Salon exhibitions um, in the late 1870s and early 1880s. And here you can see this very sober um, portrait of uh, uh, of uh, Proust, which was in theory painted in a single sitting. Uh, Manet painted this painting at least seven times on at least seven different canvases before getting the effect that he wanted in a single sitting where he finished everything except the hands. And as we look at this very grave portrait of um, 1880 in the Salon of 1880, which is now in the Toledo Museum of Art, it's hard to believe that it is more an impressionist picture than most paintings by Renoir or Monet of that date. The next year, 1881, he showed, he sort of gloried in masculinity. Uh, and the idea, both of his pictures, there's not a woman to be seen in them. The, the painting on the left is one of the largest pictures he painted in his entire career. It is in the Museum of Fine Arts in um, Sao Paulo in Brazil, so therefore it's not really familiar to most of us unless we make a trip to see it. It was savaged in the reviews of the Salon of 1881 um, because of its violet color, for its uh, of the background, um, for its implausibility. I mean, why is this hunter on his knee 
knees with this huge gun looking at something when there's this obviously dead and obviously fake lion um, in the background um, looking at him. What is he hunting and where is he hunting and what is he doing? Uh, the picture raised more questions about the nature of masculinity and hunting than it answered. Uh, the small portrait actually won a second class medal in the salon and it's a portrait of Henri Rochefort who was in fact a political radical, a man whose politics were rather different from Manet's own bourgeois um, politics, centrist politics. And it's a picture um, which was both rejected by the sitter who thought it was ugly and so wouldn't take it from Manet as a gift, um, but it did win a prize. And we see these two pictures um, as works of art that interrogate masculinity um, in a very powerful way, in a way that we don't normally associate Manet. One thinks about Manet as being a, por a, a painter of women. So, in 1882, the final Salon of his life, because he dies early in 1883, before uh, the Salon of that year, um, he shows these two paintings. And of course, we know very well, well the bar at the Folies Berger um, in the Courtauld Institute in London. And now we're going to begin to know very well the second picture, which was absolutely unanimously loved by the critics, um, which was exhibited at the Salon under the name Jeanne, J-E-A-N-N-E, -N -N -E, um, the, the female first name um, that obviously raises the issue of the identity of the model, and of course her name was Jeanne, but we don't know from the title of the painting in the exhibition catalog precisely who she was, and that will come up in a minute. This picture we know so well because it was immediately bought by a famous collector, um, the great composer Chabrier, um, who we see in this rather hapless uh, pastel by Manet, which th thank God the Getty didn't buy. Um, um, and once, you know, the poor guy, Manet actually sort of got him pretty well, but he had the good taste to buy this great painting. And it has this kind of moral gravity, this painting, even though it represents something so profoundly transitory and silly, but it has all of these allusions to works of art that are sacred, and particularly to works of art that show um, either a meal, the Last Supper, or a meal, or the resurrection of Christ from the tomb, uh, this one which Manet owned a black and white photograph of, and which was one of his favorite pictures. It's also a painting which has been interrogated over and over and over and over by art historians, art critics, and artists. Um, I show you it here uh, juxtaposed to a contemporary photograph made in homage to it by Jeff Wall, the Canadian color photographer. And there are books about this painting. It's almost, you know, it's almost buried under, the, under the, the writing about it. If you tried to read about this painting, you want to run away in horror because it prevents you actually from looking at it. Not so Jeanne. And Jeanne is a painting which has been in private collections and in inaccessible private collections until it was acquired by the Getty. It was in only two important exhibitions, the Salon of 1882 um, and the retrospective exhibition of, at Manet, after Manet's death in 1884. After that, it was completely buried, sh shown in uh, summer shows at the Metropolitan Museums and little shows about um, clothing and fashion and interiors um, at Wildenstein's through the years, exhibitions that no important art historian saw or reviewed. It essentially is missing um, from the literature. And in a funny way, it's missing largely because it's so sheerly beautiful. It was probably commissioned by this man, Antonin Proust, who you've seen before, who was one of Manet's friends. They'd gone to art school together early on. Proust had more money than Manet. He was a, an important critic and writer, and he was to become the Minister of Culture um, the year after the painting was painted. And in fact, he gave um, the Legion of Honor to Manet before Manet died, and so the kind of delicate dance um, between these two men, a dance of power is very important, and it was Proust who commissioned four pictures of beautiful women from Manet in 1881, that salon where his um, portrait, the salon after where his portrait showed, and Jean belonged to him, though he didn't pay for it until after the exhibition. So here's a picture, picture that was commissioned by an enormously powerful man, um, purchased from Manet by that man, a picture that raises all of these issues of extraordinary and, and absolutely at the peak 
of, of health and youth and, and uh, fecundity, this glorious young woman whom we know only as Jeanne in the, in the exhibition catalogs. We see her in front of this kind of riot um, of uh, foliage, which I'll identify in a minute, wearing very up-to-the-minute clothing, um, though clothing which has its own, oddly enough, modesty, and I'll talk about that in a minute too. And we see her looking away in a manner that allows us, that gives us permission to look at her without guilt. There, we can examine every single aspect of this painting without her looking back at us. This is a painting that doesn't return our glare like so many of Manet's paintings. It was probably one of a series of paintings which Manet came to think of as representing the Four Seasons. And the other painting that survives from that group is the painting on the right, um, which represented autumn in the series, and it's in the Musée des Beaux-Arts in Nancy in France. Each of them re represents a beautiful young woman, um, though Mary Laurent on the right is not quite as peachy in her youth um, as Jean is on her left. And of course, she's autumn, not spring. And one thinks about whether Manet was thinking about. One doesn't know the others, but I have a feeling that this painting, which is in the Dallas Museum, is an unfinished evocation of winter. Um, it represents another beautiful young woman, a woman named Isabelle Le Monnier, her, whose father was the sort of Cartier of the 1870s in Paris, very wealthy, very extravagant, beautiful young woman whom Manet adored. The size of the painting isn't right, but we know that Manet himself resized pictures and that pictures were resized after his death, and we know it from these two pictures, the one at the left used to look like the one on the right. The one at the left is at, the, is at Orsay, and the one on the right is at the Kimball Art Museum. And in fact, this one had all of the rostrum removed um, from the painting because of its pictorial awkwardness. And so it's, and Manet oftentimes resized pictures, so it's perfectly possible that this woman was winter as well. Manet was fascinated by women and seasonality and the seasonality of fashion because fashion is the seasonality of cities. When you're in a city, it's, nature isn't so important, though in France, of course, nature is not unimportant because of the number of parks and boulevards. But in fact, the idea of the woman as carrying and fashion as carrying this kind of seasonal shift so that you know that somebody is wearing something that they wouldn't wear in another season, that the clothing is the season um, in the city. And we know lots of paintings that represent four, four, the four seasons. This is a famous two, this is spring and autumn from a famous series by Archimbaldo, but there were others by friends of his, including um, his great friend and sister-in-law, Bert Morisot, um, and Alfred Stevens, um, the Belgian artist who was then living and working in London. Manet was fascinated by profiles, and it is, this painting is not strictly a profile because of course we see her other eye and we can see around her head, and so there's a sense of her volume, um, which is very definitely expressed in her body. Her body definitely has volume, um, as does her head, and we see, but we see Manet using this kind of device um, as a, a way of picturing women in particular. And there are many representations of women in profile by Manet, both in painted form and in pastels. This is the beautiful um, woman, um, Irma, Bru Irma Brunner, um, who was an Austrian who lived in Paris and who was incredibly glamorous. And of course, Manet loved glamour. He was, he went to, in fact, he went shopping with a lot of these women. He took them or went with them when they bought um, accessories or when they were fitted with a dress. In a sense of actually knowing the world of fashion is something very much that these pictures are about. Every hat is observed, the cut and character of the bodice, the way the garment is sewn, its particular colors are very closely interrogated by Manet. Um, this is another portrait of a beautiful, pert young woman named Madame, Mademoiselle Le Maire. He liked him young, and I'll explain this a little bit later, and this is uh, another one of his absolutely perfect silhouettes. 
a work of art that's oddly uninteresting psychologically. We have no interest in these young women as people. We're interested in them as objects, and we look at them because they're in profile. We can examine them very much like we examined an ancient coin or a bust um, on a building. The idea of this has deep roots in the Italian Renaissance, as we know, and Manet was very well aware of profile portraits of young women, um, which he'd seen many of in his travels in Italy um, and his peregrinations through the Louvre. And one can see here how similar this is as a type of object, the young woman out of doors. Um, this one, of course, is one of a pair. It's an anonymous painting. And this one by Filippo Lippi um, in the Metropolitan Museum. Um, you sort of want to take him out because it sort of ruins the whole picture. But Man Manet takes him out um, and leaves one alone to look at her. Or more, this extraordinary Piero de Cosimo that represents a, an allegorical woman rather than a real woman because we read Jeanne in all of her particularity as being an allegory of spring, an allegory of something rather than being a portrait because one doesn't do portraits except in the Renaissance quite like this or the extraordinary series of paintings by Botticelli and his studios of women just beauties of the period of time, which, were, uh, which play a, a very important role in Botticelli's career and a, a role that's really analogous to the role that this painting and the other profile portraits play in Manet's career. Then there's this idea of women representing flora, women representing flowers and being in flower. And this, this sense is something that Manet was very interested in and obviously knew um, the art history of it. We all, oftentimes, we must remember um, that the Impressionists were not visually illiterate. And though Pizarro did say that he wanted to burn the Louvre, he said it when he was 21, and he later recounted it. Um, and the idea of going to the museum and placing one's work, no matter how contemporary, um, within art historical precedent is a very important thing. Um, this is by Francesco Melzi, and it's a representation of woman as flower, of flora. And of course, we know there are very famous um, paintings of flora um, by Rembrandt, this one in the Hermitage, of which Manet also owned a photograph, and this one in the National Gallery in London, which has wonderful uh, and deep art historical resonance between the two. There is a similar kind of beauty in each of them or the great flower dress in the entire history of French 19th century painting, Ang's portrait of Madame Moitessier, and you can imagine him slaving over each of those flowers in this huge and important dress, whereas Manet paints them rather differently, rather more joyfully, rather more loosely, and with a sense that in painting them, he's caressing the model. He knew as well this wonderful profile portrait of Madame Camus, whom he knew, and who he knew very well its artist, um, Duga. And if any two paintings are the opposite, one night, the other day, one autumnal, uh, the other um, uh, um, uh, spring-like, one in which the light is cast, cast from within the picture and the other from without. When we look at her as a profile portrait and a painting of flora, of woman as flora, she begins to have deep art historical resonance, a kind of art historical resonance that makes us realize that this seemingly simple painting is too, too is a, 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 an embodiment of Manet's knowledge of the history of art and his ambitions as a painter. Now, what of its sitter? Her name was Jean de Marcy, but that actually wasn't her name. That was her nom de plume. She was born Anne Ber Berthaud. I think that's right. Scott Allen will correct me if he's here. I, it's all in my head, and sometimes my head at the age of 67 has large parts that fall off of it. Um, but there are many, many, many photographs of this young beauty. And what's fascinating about her is we know actually quite a lot about her, except very little in the period in which Manet painted her. She's born in Limoges in 1865. That means when Manet painted her in the painting on the left, she was 16 years old. And when he first met her and first painted her two years earlier, she was only 14 years old. So she's not a budding young actress because she's never even had a part yet. 
and her debut in the theater didn't occur until 1887, um, after four years after Manet's death. So one sees a kind of extraordinarily blooming young teenager in the fullness of her life, but when we look at her today, it's very difficult to think of her as being 16 years old. I'm gonna show you a whole series of photographs of her because she was photographed by almost all the great Parisian commercial photographers in the middle and late 1880s and early 1890s when she was at the height of her career. And the photographs show us a woman who is very different than the woman Manet painted, though we know that this painting actually represents um, Jean, uh, Jean de Marcy. Here she is in a rather gl glorious dress. She's associated with fashion very clearly, and you can see her wearing all these different kinds of hats. You can also see that her hair is variously dark and light at various phases in her career, um, suggesting that her image extended to her hair color as well as to her uh, what she wore. And here she is, mo most of these photographs date from 1887 or 1888. Um, here she is in, in another role in a, in a killer dress with pearls and lace and all sorts of things on it, much more elaborate as a fashion statement than Manet's rather simpler dress. And here again, draped in pearls and ruffles and jewelry, um, looking at one with kind of curly hair that one takes to be brown or maybe even reddish in color um, from the black and white photographs. Um, deep set eyes, wonderful regular features of the face, and an almost perfect oval face. Here she is again. In this case, she's playing a role. She's cast, she's cast by the photographer in a role, um, not wearing a glorious dress, wearing a simpler dress, sitting in a chair as if she is becoming someone other than Jean de Marcy. And of course, Jean de Marcy is her, is her stage name, not her real name. Here she is again, a pretty unfortunate photograph. Thank God Manet didn't see her like that or paint her um, like that with an, an incredible dress. And I want, I'm showing you all of these to give, give you a sense that in painting her, Manet was really not evoking the person. The person that we see in the photographs is very different, much more coquettish, much more fashion conscious, um, much more uh, much using her body um, and her gestures much more freely than she does um, with Manet. Here is the one um, photograph of her in profile so that we can sort of interrogate the nose and the eyes and the lips of Manet. Um, and the hair, you can see, is very different. It's very light colored compared um, to Manet's dark colored hair. And so Manet takes what he needs from this young woman. Um, how he met her, we don't know. And it'll be fascinating when the Getty begins to work on these pictures by Manet for an important exhibition in the future to be called Modern Beauty. I'm sure that Scott Allen and Gloria Groom, his partner in Chicago, will teach us a good deal that I don't even know today. Here one sees her sitting on a bench in a conservatory that Manet only had access to in 1879, which means that she was only 14 years old when he met her. And he met her, and he represents her a bunch of times. I'm sorry about the hideous photograph on the left, but it was the only available one on Lyme, Al, Al Ami stock photo, um, in a pastel on the right. And when you look at all of these pictures and you begin to think about what she actually looked like, you begin to realize that there's a good deal of work to do on the identification of Manet's subjects, that we actually don't know in many cases who these young woman, women were. Now, a good deal of the writing about Manet in the early 1880s is about his sense of fashion, his fascination with clothes shopping, with the texture of lace and clothing. Um, he writes to people asking them to send him parasols and hats so that he can draw them. He goes out to visit with them. And the painting has oftentimes been criticized for being really a fashion plate, being something that's like a fashion plate. Well, as soon as you compare it 
to fashion plates, that idea goes out the window. Because not only does it not look like a fashion plate, it looks, at, in fact, more like an early Renaissance painting than like a fashion plate. But the clothes that she's wearing, no matter how beautiful and refined, are actually very simple um, compared to the dress dresses which appear routinely in fashion plates of 1880 and 1881. And I'm just going to show you a group of them. Um, here we have the, the, both, the, both these young women and these young women are at the beach. You can imagine walking on the beach, and here's the, the mountains in the background, and here they are, and they've got their parasols. And these dresses are so elaborate and so overlayered and so complex and so filled full of kind of geometries and, and details that one scarcely looks at the woman who inhabits the dress. The dress is everything, the woman only a, a model for it. And one sees that in work after work after work. These, all of these fashion plates I'm showing you are exactly contemporary or just before the painting. And you can see very clearly that though Manet is really interested in fashion, he's not interested in fashion in the fashion plate manner. Here's one of a, of a, of a mother, a servant, and uh, her young daughter um, out in the country. This is the only one in which the sleeves are rather like this. And I can hardly wait till um, Gloria, and, who's a fashion expert at the Art Institute, gets a hold of this. This is a dress which is of almost exactly the same period made in Paris in 1880 or 1881. Um, which is in the Metropolitan, but even it is much more elaborate in its bodice and its sewing and all of these details than Manet allows it to be. In fact, when you look at Manet's dress, it's very, very simple in terms of its construction. It's not something that is uh, consciously elaborate, that's about the skill of the seamstress and the designer. The dress really is about the woman who wears it. It's also interesting to look at the fabric that Manet paints because it's a particular kind of very luxurious fabric, either silk or very high quality cotton or linen. And you can see that it's very definitely not a mechanically printed, inexpensive, three color um, uh, uh, um, kind of fabric that one sees down here. It's much more like a fabric like this, which comes from Lyon. This is a pattern. Um, which was introduced in 1879. Um, it was used for um, upholstery and curtains and walls, and then it became a dress uh, fabric in the early 1880s. And you can see very clearly that Manet is looking at something which isn't exactly this, but much more like it. Um, where, and this dress actually becomes about the fabric more than about the cut and the ruffles and the details. It's the the interplay between the flowers and plants that are real in the background and the flowers and plants that are um, woven on the figure. The same with the hats. Um, there, were, there are tons of illustrations of hats in the fashion press, and of course they all do the same thing as the dresses in the fashion press. They're all in incredibly complicated and elaborate, and they're about the skill of the hat maker with ribbons and artificial flowers and little doohickeys and doodads, and one sees them here. And you can't find any hat, really, which is as simple and clear um, as Manet's straw hat with a ruffled band, um, artificial flowers, jonquils, and roses, and this very strange black um, uh, uh, ribbon, which I still haven't figured out. If anybody, we can talk about black ribbons afterwards. Manet was riveted by hats and drew them a lot. Um, these are actually illustrated letters to Mary Laurent, the woman in the Dallas picture who he was smitten by and who saved his letters. Um, I'm, uh, undoubtedly, there are letters from Manet to the other women that he painted, but those letters weren't saved um, by their sitter. And one can see how much about the turn of the head, the hat, um, the way the head works, um, that these little sketches by Manet are about. He was fascinated by the parasols. He probably bought or borrowed a parasol in order to paint the painting exactly, because the parasol is very clearly defined. It's more like this simple one down below. This is a parasol from 1879, and this is a parasol from 1882, um, both in Parisian public collections. This one much, much more elaborate. Um, than the one he chooses. So he goes the middle ground in all of this. 
Now, he paints so many women who are out of doors and who are shown in different ways out of doors and who are beautiful in different ways. This is a painting on the left that I know very well because it's at the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, it's a painting that looks like it was painted in 20 minutes. It's so quick and the surface is so wonderful and the, and the beer, the head of the beer is still on the beer. So he wants you to think that he's been rushing to paint it before the head goes down and the signature is over there uh, reminding you of it. And of course she is completely bovine. Her face has very few marks. She hardly, they can hardly assemble um, into a head and she's reading an illustrated journal. The implication being that she's either illiterate or bored with anything to, so time consuming as reading. So she's looking. And of course we are looking at her. And in this painting we look much more slowly and carefully. And there is a sense in which Manet too is exploring every single aspect of her complexion, her hair, her eyelashes, her arms, her bosom, her, the way that she, her gloves, the way that she holds um, the parasol, uh, the nature of her head, the relationship of her eyes, even her maquillage, the way that she um, wears her makeup. He explores women out of doors in a whole series of pictures, beginning with a series of pictures that have to do with croquet and women and men um, playing out of doors in croquet. The, this early one, um, which is painted on the North Coast, and this later picture um, with wonderful sort of sparkling um, effects of light with the two women being the dominating characters and the male figures being sort of props um, for them and their clothes or this glorious painting in the conservatory, um, which is uh, a painting of his uh, painter friend, um, uh, Guillaume, um, who was married to an American who had this thing like good American wives did in France in the 19th century, which is called money. And she's, uh, she's sitting here in her very expensive dress, um, looking, looking not at her husband, but being looked at by Manet and by her husband in this kind of triangulation uh, of gazes in a conservatory which Manet painted in, um, owned by a, a painter friend in 1879. Here's his wife, plump, slightly portly, a little ruddy, um, not the fashion plate type, sitting in the same chair um, in the same conservatory painted quickly. Here is a salon painting um, rejected by the salon, one of the most perplexing and beautiful paintings of Manet's career from the Salon of 1878. This is at the Barnes Foundation. And if you've not yet been to the new Barnes Foundation, get on the plane after the Academy Awards and go there because it is beautiful. And this painting, one of the greatest Manets in America, is a painting which too has been very little looked at and very little published and is extremely difficult to interpret, much more difficult to interpret um, than the painting um, at, the, at the Getty. Here are little sort of studies painted in gardens that Manet rented during the summer. He never owned property in the countryside. He always rented houses in a series of suburbs between 1879 um, and 1882. And people, attractive young women came to see him. Um, they would stay for lunch, they would be painted, they would be part of his kind of uh, afternoon cure um, as he was getting more and more ill and as he was looking um, at women in greenery, this glorious painting which remains in a private collection um, of a woman seated in a garden that's just bursting with life. It's a garden that has, that has more aesthetic power than any garden painted by Monet or Renoir in the 1870s. The watering can, this glorious woman um, reading her, uh, her novel, her yellow based novel in the full excitement and glory of a garden or just the garden itself, the various rented gardens. Manet had a greater sense than any other painter except Renoir of the chaos of nature, of the fact that even a garden, um, it can be overgrown and can be strange and can have kind of lurking forms and cannot be controlled. For him, the garden is always beyond control in these pictures, which are very difficult um, for us to look at and for us to think of as being great 
today. Here are two chaos pictures again um, in a garden out of doors with the, the, the geraniums and the flowers and everything sort of flying around on the surface of the painting, wet on wet, hardly able um, to maintain their place in space. Or these, the last great paintings of his garden in Rue, um, in which he even denies himself by the placement of himself in the tree admission to the house which he had rented. Um, a picture which is very much a prefiguration of his own death a little bit later. Or Morisot's garden scenes, which he loved enormously and which um, place the figures in the garden so that the figures in the garden become one. For Manet, the figure is always apart from the garden. For Morisot, the figure and the garden go together. And this is her husband, Manet's brother, Eugène Manet, um, and her, uh, Manet's niece, um, Julie Manet. When one sees again the Getty picture with this glorious picture near it, you prefer this and you can understand why Manet sent it to the Salon because it has a kind of level of perfection and calm and control of the very nature that it's painting, which this painting lacks. This painting is a little bit on edge, nervous, exciting, something that is the opposite um, of the preternatural calm, that moment in spring of becoming, which is captured by Manet in 1881 in the spring picture. You can also see that it represents rhododendrons, and rhododendrons were gaining um, popularity in French gardens largely because of their popularity on the other side of the channel in English gardens. And the rhododendrons here um, are, are beginning to flower in white, but he's fascinated really with the structure of the, of the leaves and the stems in the rhododendrons and is really interested in the relationship between the patterning of real stems and leaves and the patterning of, 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 of woven stems and leaves or printed stems and leaves on the dress. Now what's interesting about this is that this is a painting by Renoir painted in 1882, the year after uh, Manet's painting, and it represents Jean de Marcy. This is the same woman, painted by two different artists within a year of each other. And you can see how much an artist himself controls ways in which we view the model, because it is not possible for us to accept that these are the same women. They're two different women when we look at them, and only when we know that they're the same women because of documents and verbal sources, um, do, are we struck by the fact that each of the artists has a way of viewing women, has a way of painting women, has a way of communicating with paint that is fundamentally different. One returns again to the original context of view of this painting where it was compared to a work of art in which there's a profile and a frontal view. There's a woman who looks for all the world as if she is bourgeois, though she had working class origins, Jean de Marcy on the right, and a woman who actually was a bar, a barmaid in the Folies Bergère who came and modeled um, for Manet in this picture, a, work, a real working woman, but a woman who is unafraid to accept our gaze and to look disconsolate and melancholic as she is directly into our eyes as we look at the painting. The two moods of these two pictures could not be more different and the way in which they use the figure, the setting of the figure, and project a kind of meaning and on the one hand of melancholy and isolation in the midst of urbanity and urban entertainment, on the other hand of the peak of beauty in springtime on a beautiful day. Both of them appeared in the Salon of 1882, and here are the Salon catalogs of 1882, and there are many catalogs and many books about the Salon um, about which one can look at the pictures. And what I want to do now is to contrast um, the pictures that Manet showed at the Salons with what his Impressionist colleagues were showing at exactly the same time in the Saul Reichhofen in Paris in the Impressionist exhibition of 1882, the penultimate Impressionist exhibition. It's an exhibition that was held in one room of an enormous building with, which had a, um, a, a panorama in the back for which people paid admission. 
and you came in and went up the stairs. These were tapestries which stayed put. It was sky lit, so lit by nature during the day. The Impressionist paintings were all in this room in 1882, and there was electric light, and the, and the gallery remained open until midnight in 1882 so that working people could see the exhibition or people who had gone to the theater could see the exhibition at night. There is no printed catalog of the exhibition. There's only one handwritten catalog of the exhibition. And you can see, of course, that there is no Manet there. But there were very ambitious pictures that are the same size and type as Manet's pictures in that exhibition. One of them was this large painting by, and you'll, you, you wouldn't flunk your orals if you didn't guess that it was by Gauguin, because almost nobody would guess that it's by Gauguin, but it is by Gauguin. Um, a picture which is as large as the, uh, as the, as the, um, the Follies Bergère picture by Manet, and which was called simply Etude de Fleurs, Study of Flowers. Um, in the middle of a wall, this painting by Caillebotte of Bézique of male um, bonding um, over a card game in an upper class interior was in the middle of another wall. This picture was in the middle of the third wall in that exhibition. And think of this picture when you look at this picture because they were seen exactly at the same moment in different kinds of exhibitions. One which Manet embraced till the end of his life, the Salon, the other, the exhibition of independence, which they begged him over and over and over, even in 1882, um, to include himself, but was never persuaded. So you see this, a painting that's about conviviality, a painting that was painted in a very short period of time for which there are no preparatory drawings or studies. Um, it's a direct painting, if ever there was one, by um, uh, Renoir at the Phillips Collection. And this painting, which is really about alienation, if this painting is about conviviality and ways in which men and women gather together with alcohol and food in nature, enjoying themselves. Here, no one is enjoying themselves. There's a sense in which this woman is as haunted as any figure by Munch. The other figures uh, in this exhibition, and there are lots of figure paintings in this exhibition. Here are two Renoirs in the exhibition, um, the one on the right at the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, called, it's called On the Terrace at, at Chicago, but it was called The Two Sisters um, in the exhibition. Um, paintings by Pizarro, which one sees here. Other paintings by Renoir. There are a whole group of ambitious figure pictures at the exhibition, and what's fascinating is that that on the left, in on the terrace, or the two sisters by Renoir, is Jean de Marcy. So we have Jean de Marcy both in the Impressionist exhibition, probably several times, because she was clearly at this point not an actress, but a painter's model. And she made her money being a painter's model as a teenager, being uh, cared for in the city by her older sister. And this wonderful Pizarro um, in the National Gallery in London, a picture that couldn't be more opposite of Manet's urbane um, work of art. Or this ghastly picture of 1881, a full scale by Bartolome, of, of his wife coming in from the terrace, a painting which is every bit about fashion. And Manet's painting is not every bit about fashion. When Manet received all the accolades for this picture, he decided that it was important for him to have it reproduced, and people came to him asking for him to reproduce it. More the Jean than the more famous painting of today, um, the bar at the Folies Bergère at the Courtauld Institute. This young man, Charles Clot, um, whom uh, Manet was rather close to and, and had a good relationship, and in fact was very friendly with his young man's mistress, a woman named Nina de Callas, who Manet had painted in the middle of the 1870s. He was a poet and an inventor and a scientist who developed a process of color photography in the late 1860s, which he was trying to turn into a mode to reproduce works of art. Manet tried, first of all, by making an etching um, for the painting, and there's no way that you can convey the chromatic majesty and the sense of brushwork and the liberation of color and form that one feels in the Manet painting uh, with this essay, etching, autograph as it is. This is a drawing made by Manet too um, from the painting, which is fascinating to look at but rather inert 
by comparison to the painting. I mean, it's oftentimes compared to the etching which Manet himself um, worked on. But here, in one of the Salon publications, is, oops, is the etching, or this, this is a reproduction of the drawing by Manet, and this is a color photograph of the painting, which is, has been published as and might actually be the first color reproduction of any work of art ever successfully made. So y y the painting at the Getty not only is in itself beautiful, but was the result of a, a personal knowledge and a kind of aesthetic experiment with Manet and Charles Crow using the photographic technology to make something um, as brilliantly colored and extraordinarily be beautifully painted into a reproduction in which you could, in theory, evoke the object. It's clear that Crow failed. And though the, 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 the color photograph is very important in the history of photography and in the history of the reproduction of works of art in color, something which was elusive um, in the history of art, you can see very clearly that the painting itself has a kind of immediacy um, which the photograph lacks. The painting made its uh, last important appearance in this exhibition, um, the Manet exhibition of 1884, January of 1884, with its um, catalog with the preface by his dear friend, Emile Zola. Here are photographs of the exhibition. Unfortunately, none of the surviving photographs of the exhibition include the Jeanne, though we know it was in the exhibition called not Jeanne this time, or not merely Jeanne, but Jean le Printemps, Jean Spring. We see her here after all of these comparisons um, with other paintings of the sitter by Manet, um, with paintings by Renoir, particularly of the same sitter, um, with Italian Renaissance profile pictures, with fashion plates. And one returns to this image of a kind of evanescent beauty of a young 16-year-old person who Manet dressed, or who he went, he, we don't know whether he went shopping with her or whether he probably did because she didn't have any money, bought this dress. And think about him painting it. If the dress had been monochrome, it would have been very simple to paint. But when it's painted, and when it has a flowery fabric over the surface of this beautiful body, this wonderful fitted, um, uh, at the top of a dress, Manet is able as an old, sick man to caress this woman as he's painting her, to caress every part of her arm, of her underarm, of her bosom, of her waist, of her uh, burgeoning hips at the base of the painting, um, of, of the, and the sense of her wonderful double chin, that she's already beginning to eat too much and she's already beginning a little bit the collapse that will inevitably happen um, a decade later. How different she is as an element of beauty than the painting with which she appeared. That painting has obliterated her in the Manet literature and it is time to resurrect not only beauty and the concept of beauty when we look at works of art, but also this painting, um, which was Manet's last um, um, painting publicly ex exhibited along uh, with the, the, the bar at the Folies Berger. Here we see him, we see him again. We know that he dies just uh, a little uh, less than a year um, after the painting was painted. His leg was amputated finally because of all of the sores on it about two weeks before he died. He dies in the spring. He dies at the age of 51. His model was not yet 17. And in this sense of the passing of beauty, in the sense that beauty is transitory, that beauty can only be grasped for a second, and it can only last in painting. Manet makes his last contributions. During the year before he died, he was unable to leave his bed and was sometimes only wheeled into the garden and most oftentimes painted floral ar arrangements brought to him by his sister-in-law, Bert Morisot, to set on a little table which was literally over his bed and where he painted small paintings of flowers which will bloom and then die. So too, this beautiful woman will bloom and then die. Thank you.
a fabulous lecture. Um, Um, uh, Professor Patel has kindly agreed to, to take some questions, so we're just setting up. It'll take a, a minute or two, um, but do please stay if you can, and we'll take some questions and have a little discussion. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we're on. Um, well, perhaps I can start, and then we'll, 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 we'll take some questions, as I say. Um, you show Jean as um, talked about it's the fact that Manet exhibited exclusively in the Salon. Um, the traditional vehicle for an acknowledged, um, accepted uh, major artist, which is how he wanted to be seen clearly and, and didn't ever exhibit with the Impressionists, despite his work being, of course, much closer to theirs. Um, I'm turning that around, what does that mean in terms of the, the, the standard view of the Salon as being a bastion of conservatism? Here's an artist who, since the 60s, been painting highly, almost scandalous paintings um, and working in this you know, very modern vein, um, and continued to be, not, not always accepted, but was over those years, um, recurrently shown in the Salon. Has this sort of warped our view of the Salon to the point where we really um, are not doing it justice? Yeah, the, the, the Salon w became much larger as the, after the, uh, the Franco-Prussian War and, the, and the, um, the Commune and the establishment of the Third Republic the Salon became much larger, much more open to new trends in art, and much more international. Uh, and Manet's art was seen, it, it wasn't this, you know, it wasn't filled full of paintings that looked like Ang's and David's, which is what we were taught, basically. It was filled with works of art that were more ambitious in scale in the main than Impressionist pictures, and were made to be seen with many, many more works of art. And one of the reasons why the Impressionists decided to exhibit on their own is not only uh, to be seen only with, you know, in good company or in the company that they liked, but also because they only would have 240 or 250 rather than 1,000 or 1,500 works of art, which is what the Salon had. The difficulty that Manet had um, in the Salon is that to find a work in the Salon, if you were looking for it, was not easy because there were so many works. And I don't know, for example, it'll be interesting if Scott Allen in his work um, for the next exhibition finds it out, whether even the two Manets were hung in the same room. Um, one knows very little really about how salons were hung and whether the kind of comparison that I made on the screen between Jean and the Bar de Folies Berger, it would have occurred to anybody who actually went to the salon. Um, we're in the period of the presidential debate, so Scott Allen's name has been mentioned. Um, yeah. Do you like Are to you respond? Here, Scott? Oh. Uh, uh, one salon review that I looked at did proceed room by room, and yeah. as far as I recall, they were shown in separate rooms. Yeah. I think consecutive but separate rooms. Yeah, so that it would be, well, there are different kinds of pictures, so you would put them with different things, yeah. And the, the, the salon at this time was, each painter was limited to two things, so it wasn't bad that Manet only had two paintings, it was the norm. Yes? Okay, there's one in the middle. The provenance of the painting is, it's a very distinguished provenance. It was um, bought in 1883, right before Manet's death, by um, uh, uh, Proust, by Antonin Proust, who kept it until 1902, I think. No, a little bit earlier. And then it was bought by uh, the great opera singer, Faure, who was one of the most important collectors of the 19th century. And he sold it um, to Durand well in 1906. And then it's been in private collections, uh, in private collections that are very little known um, since then. It was in the Payne, was that right? The Payne collection in, in New York, the Payne Whitney of that family, and it was shown during the summers. What happens in the, at the Met is that if you're a wealthy New Yorker and if you have pictures in your Park Avenue and Fifth Avenue apartments and you go away to your house on Oyster Bay or Fisher's Island or whatever for the summer, you leave your paintings at the Met 
rather than keep them at home, and the Met shows them in a summer show. And that's where this painting was shown summer after summer after summer. So it was a kind of a spring painting turned into a summer painting. Up the back. You raised the issue. You raise the question of the question, the use of the black in the scarf mm -hmm. and how that ties into Manet's use of black in general. Could you comment on that? Well, you know, it's, it's funny because the Impressionists, as we all know, didn't use black, and Manet did, and Manet did throughout his life. Manet believed in a very strong value contrast in order as, a, as an ingredient of a successful composition. And it seems that it was necessary that her her hair, her eyelashes, um, and her scarf are black, which sort of hold this picture, which is a kind of riot of green and blue and red and yellow and orange together. That's my view. Clearly, it didn't resonate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a Manet scholar, so you, <laughs> you have to forgive me. If Juliet Wilson Barrow would, was here, I'd be pulled off the stage. <laughs> Here in the front. Hey, ask it and I'll repeat it. Well, about what? Yeah, I haven't read it. He's asked about a book called The Judgment of Paris about Manet, and, and I haven't read it. I confess <laughs> we don't always read everything. Man. Another one in and the Art Institute of Chicago. Yeah. And Scott Allen and Gloria Groom are working on it just now. And I just learned about it before I gave the talk. And Glor it's apparently called Modern Beauty, right? Well, it's an well, idea it's, you were yeah. taking around. You're yeah. hearing it here first. It's not. Yeah, it's not well, official. Yeah. He, he <laughs> so. there'll, be more, there'll be more when we're ready to sort of make the announcement. It's a bit far in the future for us yeah. to be. Um, things like the title haven't necessarily been pinned down yet, but it's on, it's it's in, it's work in progress. And two brilliant scholars work, and it, I mean, I can hardly wait to come back. Over here. You mentioned in your in your talk that Manet refused to be part of the independent impressionist salon, and I was wondering why, and if he had so much trouble with the with the main salon, why not go with some of these other and exhibit there as well? The answer is that we really don't know. They tried very hard to get him to exhibit with them. And the times that they tried the hardest were 1877, and he declined. And it turned out that his painting in 1877, Nana, was rejected by the Salon. So had he gone with them, it would have been shown. It, it, I, I, you know, Manet was very proper. Manet was haute bourgeois. Manet didn't like rebellion, though he painted rebellious people. Um, he was somebody who I think wanted to change from within rather than from without. That would be my, and he wrote nothing saying why he didn't go in with them. I think it's a terrible mistake that he made, frankly. I think that if in the exhibitions of 77 and 82, which were the greatest Impressionist exhibitions, his paintings would have looked unbelievable within that context. And his dialogue, or the dialogue with Renoir, which I think is really important and needs to be thought of more than it has been. Um, Renoir is almost never compared to Manet, and they were the two preeminent figure painters of the sort of painterly, chromatic, um, as opposed to drawn figures like, uh, like Degas. And I really think that there's a good deal to be said of this kind of dialogue um, between Manet and um, uh, Renoir. I also think that it may be Renoir who introduced Jean de Marcy to Manet because Renoir was also from, was from Limoges. And it could have been that their families knew each other. That's just another little idea. Rick, um, I might jump in here with another one. There's a, what would you say to the view that in, this is a period when artists are, are defined principally by their, at least the artists we remember today, 
and admire most today, defined by their most radical works and the, what it is that was in a way shocking or new and different. Um, and that this painting is, on the other hand, this is a painting that can be seen as in a way a return to beauty for Manet. Mm. Um, and you, you show the Renaissance um, uh, you know, precursors, if you like, of the profile view and all these things, which give it a place in a more traditional history. Do you see this as, a con as the conventional Manet um, emerging? I mean, also when you see it with the Folie Berger, which has that, in a sense, very unbeautiful, mm -hmm. um, melancholy, um, you know, more surprising. The whole concept of the painting is much more surprising. And there's Jean looking beautiful in the right dress, the right parasol, all the classic elements. Is it an easy? Is it too easy a painting? Well, you know, it's a, there. There are a lot of late Manets, and particularly his portraits of women, his single portraits of women, were called early on by John Riewoldt, the great historian of Impressionism, trop jolie, too pretty. And they, they trafficked in a kind of easy beauty, which has to do with fashion and youth. Uh, and I think that for Manet, you have to, that's one of the reasons I stressed a little bit his state of health and his age. I think that grasping on to this kind of beauty was something that was very important to him. And it was important to him in another way than the sort of high moral serious painting of paintings like the bar at the Folies Berger or the cafe pictures, which deal with social class interaction in Paris. Uh, to me, there, there's nothing wrong with what we might call easy beauty. And I think Manet actually trafficked in it more often than we think, and that it's an element of his, uh, of his style, of his, of his aesthetic. We as art historians, like, we don't like beautiful paintings. We like complicated paintings. We like paintings that we can talk about and that have all of these that are layered with all these references and problems. And it's in fact difficult to layer this painting. I tried to layer it, but you know, in an hour, but I, you know, I didn't succeed terribly well. And, and it turns out to be rather unlike all the things that it was compared to. And I think that's okay. Down here. Oh, then. I was struck by the, um, the dress and the details here. You have a mixture here of fine detail, the curvature of the beautiful flowery design on the sleeve and the upper portion of the dress, and then the abstract um, potashes uh, on, the, on the dress below, the uh, spring colors behind, which are blotches of greens and very painterly and very um, uh, amorphous, and then the fine details in the face and the parasol. It's a, it's a contrast between some abstraction in terms of oppressionistic work and then in terms of a classical detail. Would you comment about that? I, I agree. I think you're absolutely right. And I think that there are two, two modes of finish in the painting. And, that that's, that it, and it works in the painting. The painting is oddly unified, even though it's not painted in a consistent way throughout its surface. There were hands up here. Yes, no. Fourth row, and then one in the middle later, next in the middle. Back. Uh, you made an allusion to the fact that Manet preferred to paint younger girls. And why was that? Because he was old and married to an ugly, fat wife. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, you know, yeah. I, I, I think he was, you know, I, I work on Gauguin, who preferred 14-year-olds and 12-year-olds. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, this idea of finding, as you age, finding beauty in youth in something that you have lost. And it, it's something that's, ve that's very easy to uh, denigrate, but also something that's in an odd way touching. Middle of the back there, yeah. I'm glad he, he's, he's not the only one who, he's another one who may have had his tongue hanging out as he was painting. Yeah. Hi, um, the, there's a flatness to that painting and others in, um, mm -hmm. that Manet creates. And I just wanted to know if you can comment on the, if you think like the flatness had to do with anything, his interest in beauty and capturing that beauty. Well, the, the, the idea of, uh, a, a, a painting as something made and something made by an artist and an arrangement of colors on a surface is an idea which is absolutely essential to an understanding of Manet throughout his career from the late 1850s until his death in 1883. 
Um, this flatness has generally been read by historians as a, as a kind of element of, of his view of society and the modern world. And in fact, I think has more to do with, the, with his almost abstract love of painting and wanting people to look at the works of art as paintings. And you do, I mean, even when we were talking about the various surface treatments of this small picture, and I was just in the galleries now, and people tend to look at Manet's paintings very closely, and you get right up to them and into them and uh, look at his brushstroke, and in this he's the most like his great pictorial hero, who is Velasquez. And Velasquez is exactly the same. Uh, it's not modernity in the sense of Manet. Flatness is not modernity. It, it's part of an idea of painting as process, which certain painters are really interested in, no matter when they live. Up right off the back there. I, I don't know. It was very prevalent in, the, in, in artists. About Gauguin died of tertiary syphilis as well. I tend to prefer artists who had syphilis for some bizarre reason. <laughs> <laughs> Pizarro didn't. <laughs> Dugas had macular degeneration, very unsexy. <laughs> I, you know, it was a, it was a 19th and he was given mercury treatments, all these awful things. I mean, the treatment for syphilis in the 19th century was worse than the disease. It was horrible. And we have to remember it when we look at these works of art. It's very, I mean, Manet was 51 years old when he died. And he was otherwise a very healthy man. And he could have lived easily into his 80s were it not for the disease. A couple more, and then we'll have to clip there. Thank you. Um, if you could please clarify, I, oh, I may have misunderstood. Did, I, did you say that Proust, the patron that also had his portrait taken, yeah may have commissioned that yeah. painting that was also we, part of a series? We, he went around, during the, the salon, he went around talking about how he already owned the picture, which he didn't. Um, and there is a, there is a I don't know what the, Scott may know this more than I do, more in, this, in the material than I am, but there is a tradition that in 1881, um, when this picture was painted, that um, Proust uh, commissioned four paintings from Manet. And it has been assumed that those four paintings are seasonal paintings and that Manet didn't complete them because of his death. Is that correct? It, it seems a little yeah, it seems a little apocryphal. And I, I agree. That's, yeah. 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 It's only Le Printemps. It's in the in eight, after he dies in 1884, and it could come from from Proust rather than from anybody else. It's what what uh, Scott Allen is saying is that it may be apocrypha. It, it's it's important though. I mean, as a scholar too, like Scott, uh, apocryphal stories generally come about for a reason, and just because one doesn't have evidence for them doesn't mean they're wrong. Okay, time for one more. Here we are. Avenues like was he a chemist or was he a no. philosopher or anything of that nature? No. He wasn't a writer, he wasn't a philosopher, he wasn't a scientist. He was a painter. One of the purest painters and with a sense of his vocation as painter. And in that, he's very unlike a lot of the people who are around him, like Charles Crow, the guy who did the, that hideous photograph. Which, do you own that hideous photograph? No. Well, um, thank, you. thank you very much. That's been wonderful.